Hello, my name is Gal. I'm going to talk about uh, virtual functions and reversing C++ code. My presentation called uh, When Virtual Hell Freezes Over, Reversing C++ Code. So who am I? I'm a reverse engineer and a security researcher at Wireless Security Group. In my spare time, I also like sewing. And this project is my own private project that I've done at home. So the agenda of this talk. We are going to talk about two things. The first thing is about C++ internals. We are going to have some examples about how reversing these programming languages look like. And at the second part, we are going to talk about Virtual Hailer, which is a tool that I wrote that helps reversing C++ and automate this process. So the problem. Reversing C++ is hard. And now I'm going to show some examples why it's hard and how can we really reverse this C++. So object creation. In here you can see a class that I wrote and also how it looks in the assembly. Every object creation starts with the allocation of the relevant bytes for the object. And the second part is calling the constructor of the object. Now we're going to dive deep inside how the constructor does what it does. This one is a default constructor. The object starts with four bytes of the V table. After the V table, you have all the members of the object. You can see in the assembly the part that set the V table into the four first byte of the object. And you can also see the member, in this case, a float member of the object, has been set to the second four bytes. So V tables and virtual calls. In here, you can see a virtual call at the end call EAX. And one instruction backward, you can see that EDX that contains the VTable base pointer set the second function in the fourth byte um, into EAX. And this is the main problem that I wanted to solve, that I had the problem while I reversed C++. So we are going to see some of the C++ hell, which is multiple inheritance. So class C in this example inherits from two father, father A and father B. Father A and father B both implement virtual functions. But, but class C in here also implements virtual function by itself. So how does it really look like? How, how the object look like? Because it's a little different from the object that we've seen before. So this is like a table, two tables, that I shows how the object is. The first is implementing uh, it's the multiple inheritance structure. So the father A, which is the first, the first inheritance object, is created. And afterwards, the father B, which is the second inheritance of this object, is created. After you created both of these objects, you can also have the C members. So if we open it a little bit more, since we already understand how you create an object, you can see here in, on, on the right that you have the C and A. OK, we have the V table of C if it inherits from object A. And after it, you have the C V table if it inherits from B. And only after we create both of those objects, we can add the members of C. So functions calls with multiple inheritance. After you create the object and after the object is allocated, you also want to call the functions. So in a multiple inheritance, you need to explicitly say which function you want to use. Since you have two objects that you inherit from, and both of them implement virtual functions, so in both of those cases, you need to say exactly which function you want to call. So in the square before, behind me, you can see there is father A print father, and you also have father B print father. So you say explicitly who do you want to call. In the assembly, you can see that it's just a regular function call. There is no problem with it. You just call the function, no use in the V table. So it makes our life a little bit more easier. But there is also the fifth call, that is the virtual call. Because C implements foo2 function, 
you need the VTable in order to understand who do you want to call. So also in the assembly, as you can see, there is the last call, which is the call for C foo 2 using the VTable of C. So we understood that C++ requires a lot of work. You need to consider a lot of stuff, you need to break your code in order to understand which, which is the, where is the VTable, what function was called, and I wanted to make it fluffy because I wanted to automate all of this process so I don't need to do it all by myself, break the code every time, and I just wanted something to do it automatically. So IDA Python and IDC is quite an obvious this, like, thing that came up to my mind because they are already like, provided by IDA and they have lots of functionalities that can help me. So IDA Python is easy peasy to write, but IDC is more extensive. So I just decided, okay, fine, I'm gonna put everything I have in my mind into a whiteboard. So just like, put everything you see in the, in here you have lots of like, mess from my head just on the whiteboard. At the right you can see a picture I got, I was like a friend of, a child of my friend painted for me while I did it. And, <laughs> and this is how it looked like in the beginning. But this is how Virtual was born. This is how I came up with the idea. So since Ida already provides tracing, I thought like, fine, why can't I use it and automate this process? So I created trace breakpoints on the virtual calls, and I also passed the trace file that Ida provides. This like, line of code is in Ida Python, the option to change some flags in a breakpoint in order to change it to a trace breakpoint. But there was a problem with this tracing, since it didn't give me a real-time solution. It only gave me an option to see which function were called specifically and only after the program ran, and it didn't give me a real-time solution. So I said, okay, fine. I need to find something new, something better, something that can do it dynamically. But how? How can I make it a dynamic solution? So, okay, we know there is the virtual call assignment to the register. So I said, why wouldn't I, if I can find the right virtual calls, why wouldn't I just take taint backward and find the instructions that assign the VTable to the right, to the right register? And then I can create a struct with the VTable, and then I also can add references, and then make all the reverse engineering process of C++ automated. So at the beginning, I like, started to understand how to create breakpoints with IDA Python. So this is how you create a breakpoint with IDA Python. You can see a few simple functions. The simplest one is the add PPT, which is add the breakpoint. You set the address, you set the type of the breakpoint, since you have software breakpoint, hardware breakpoint, and also a page breakpoint and some more. So in this case, I want a software breakpoint on the code. Uh, you also have the function enable BPT, which is if you want to enable or disable, and you kind of want to enable the breakpoint so it would work. <laughs> Um, and also something much less common, which is set the breakpoint condition. So in IDA, you also have an option to add a condition to breakpoints. And if you add a condition to breakpoints, you can have much more functionalities than you had before. So what I decided to do is hook the VTables pointer. And I want to, so I wanted to use the conditions that the breakpoints provide in order to hook the relevant part of the assignment of the breakpoints, of the VTables. So at the beginning, I found all the, virtual, all the virtual calls, which was easy. I just look for a call and a register, and then I could hook all those places. But I need to taint it backward and find the right place where the assignment of the VTable is. So this is part of the code that does what, like, look the, for the move of the VTable pointer and the function into the register. So conditional, conditional breakpoint has a hook. I mentioned it sometimes, sometime, like before. Uh, so I wanted to write the code inside the breakpoint. But I want to add a false condition at the end so the breakpoint will not stop the program from running. I want it to be non-intrusive in the way that it's 
doing what it does. So the user can just run its C++ code, and on the background, I'm going to create all the structures, add the comments to the IDA, to IDA, and everything will be without interrupting the user. So I need to disable the break of the breakpoint and only run my code. But I found some problems on the way. Since conditional breakpoint in IDA Python only provides IDC conditions, which might be a good option, just that in a conditional breakpoint, you can include the IDC.IDC file, which contains most of the functionalities that IDC provides. So then I couldn't really do what I want with IDC as a condition. And I thought, like, fine, no matter what, I'm going to find IDA Python. I'm going to change it to IDA Python in the condition. So we dived into IDA Python modules and looked for a way to change it because I really want the condition to work. So if you look at set BPT condition, which is the IDA Python option to change the condition, there is no way to change the language in here. So it's differently set to IDC, and there is no way to change it from here. So I said, like, in IDC, there is this option. So I'm going to look at IDC files. Maybe it will give me some hint of how I can, how I can do it in IDA Python. So in class breakpoint inside IDC, so there is an attribute elang that contains the language of the conditional. So, OK, elang is quite a good option. There must be a way in IDA Python to do the same thing. So I saw there is also class BPTT, which is a proxy of C++ breakpoint class. And there is an Elang attribute in it. So if I can manually change it, I will just have my IDA Python condition. So yay, it worked. <laughs> this is how you create a breakpoint with a condition in IDA Python. I just created an object, the class, the object BPTT, and changed manually the Elang member to my like Python. So in here, you can see you have self.elang because it's part of a bigger function that you can choose if you want to write the condition in Python or in IDC. In this case, Python. <laughs> so the hook, what the hook really does is that it creates IDA structures of the V table. It also connects the structure that I created, that the program creates, into the virtual calls to the relevant register that contains the pointer. It adds reference and comments, and it also correlates the, the vtable base pointer to the structure. So this is the hook. This is the condition inside the breakpoint that does all of what I said before. OK, so this is how the code looked like before you run the virtualer. You can see there is like opcodes, like virtual calls in here, but you can't see anything more than this. And after you run my code, you can see vtable structure were created automatically. You have the vtable, the address to the vtable if you want to statically see the vtable afterwards, the functions, and also you have comments of where the function were called from, which, like which address the virtual call were made from. This is the disassembly after the, the plugin will run. You can see there is lots of comments and also the structure offset like were set to EDX. So you can see the function itself. You see in the first virtual call, you see the jump to father A print father. And also, as you can see, there is a comment with the virtual call address, and it correlates, both of them are correlating. The, the offset from here and from here, the addresses are the same. So this makes the reversing much easier. You just run your code once, and all of this is just set automatically. You don't need to do it by yourself, and you can just reverse it statically afterward. But I want to make it like a bigger tool that provides much more options that it provides now. So some of the things that I think can make it better is to add the object, the structure for the object itself. Since you have operator new, which is a dynamic allocation of an object, and you can create the object, the structures, the inheritance, and it can all save lots of time for reversals of C++. 
I also want to add local and static uh, object creation to my tool, but this is going to be um, at the future. Also thought about like adding logic to the functions. Since in here I had I wrote the code, so I already know what the function name are. But sometimes, well, most of the time, <laughs> you don't know what the function names are. But you have some strings, loops. You sometimes have function calls inside a function that can help you understand if this function is relevant or not. So if I could add it to the structure as comments or in the name of the function, it might help understand if we really want to reverse this function further or not. So this is what I want to do next. Um, so this is it. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? This is the longest staircase yes. ever. <laughs> okay, thank you. It was very really interesting. Thank uh, you. So I have a question. You mentioned that you track back the assignment to the V table, but how do you do it when you are inside another method that you don't have? Uh, like, how do you track back to the constructor to figure out what was the V table? You mean if I want to know which V table was assigned to an object? Yeah. Oh, okay. C can you repeat the question? And okay. So, so I mean, if you're inside the constructor, then it's easy. You see the assignment of the V table in, mm -hmm. in the constructor. But if you're inside another method outside so of the constructor, if I know like which V table is relevant for the constructor, like at the end. Yeah, at, at the place of the call, how do you how do you figure out the V table? You mean at, when I want to add the objects or just like what happens now? Because I don't know that the constructors part are part of the object creation that I still don't have in my code now. It's something that I want to add in the future. So I thought about some options to do it and some paths that I want to take, but I didn't have, I don't have now a concrete way of how I want to do it. If you talk about the vtable assignment. Well, anyway, um, how do you track uh, from the call EAX, for example, ah, how do okay. you figure out the, the vtable? OK, fine. Now I understood. <laughs> OK. And so what I do is that I look for assignment to the specific register from the call. If I have call EAX, which is usually the option, but I also like check all the register. It depends on the operand from the virtual call. So I check to a, an assignment for this register with, some, with move or with some other options. And then I see the register, the relevant register, and the offset inside this register. The register contain, contains the V table, and the offset is the offset inside the V table. So this is how I do it. It doesn't only go one instruction backward. It looks until it finds the assignment to the right register. And so this is how I do it. I had a function there. If you want, I can show you more. And it also be published in GitHub. So um, you can see it also in there. Uh, hey, so you're using uh, dynamic data and making mm -hmm. annotations. Uh, and then you're doing a static analysis later. Did you ever come up uh, upon a case where actually your static comments are wrong in some <coughs> scenarios? So if you run the program the second time, mm -hmm. the values will be different functions? So I also, what I do is that if you run your code and you go to a virtual call, it can call a few V tables. So I don't want to delete the last comment I want to add. So what I do is that I append all the virtual calls so I wouldn't miss anything, like, because this is kind of point if you do only the last call. So it just adds all the, vir I couldn't, I didn't show it here, but what it does, it didn't, it doesn't delete the comment, it just adds more comment. So then you have like a longer comment with all the functions that were called and all the V tables. Okay. okay. <laughs> Any more questions? Hi. Uh, Hi. Thanks for the very good talk. Uh, my question is actually whether this tool is going to be open source and available for contribution in the future. So I'm going to publish my code in a month uh, after uh, Troopers. 
Uh, it's going to be on GitHub, open source. Everyone can just contribute to the code, make it better, and just like use it because I really believe that people should publish what they have. I think like it can help lots of people, so I will publish it. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Gal. Thank you.